to our Kingdom Link podcast. We are so happy and honored that you've chosen to join with us today. Today is a very exciting and special podcast uh, here with my father, Tim W. Gill, but we also have author and pastor, Brother John C. Carroll. And today we're going to be talking over his book, uh, Are You a Christian? Redefining Apostolic. And today we are going to be having a drawing and a contest to see who can win a free book for uh, this Are You a Christian book. Uh, and Dad's going to go over some of the stipulations for this contest. Yeah, just real quick, uh, we'll, we'll we'll reaffirm this at the end of the podcast. But if you'd like to have, uh, like to win uh, the book here, are you a Christian? Is go to Kingdom Link Podcast Facebook page, and underneath the post that will be posted about the giveaway, write a comment. Then go to Brother Carroll's uh, Forward Talk uh, YouTube page subscribe hit the subscribe button and also go to our podcast and subscribe to kingdom link Uh, if you're already a subscriber just make sure you put a comment underneath and then we'll select from those Mm -hmm. we're delighted to have brother carol with us today so thankful for this opportunity we've been looking forward to this brother absolutely and we're we're going to see what god has for us today uh brother carol has been preaching since the age of 16 that's correct and uh, has been in full-time ministry since 19 so uh you've been uh, working in the kingdom full-time for the vast majority of your calling yes sir uh ministered in 48 states and eight countries You've served as an evangelist, an executive pastor. Now you're serving as the pastor, the lead pastor of Point of Mercy in Lisbon, Ohio. Yes, sir. And uh, I I noticed that uh, you have been a church planner Mm -hmm. and a conference speaker, camp meeting preacher, author, as you can tell by by what our topic is today. And you're currently pursuing your degree in biblical studies. That's just kind of like a a nutshell of of you. What would you like... uh, are, are, are your viewers and our listeners uh, to know about Brother Carroll? Well, I was uh, I was raised in a pastor's home. My dad was pastoring in Faraday, Louisiana. Um, he had been he pastored there for about nineteen and a half years. Yes, sir. And uh, he left um, he left the church there when I was about nine or ten years old. And so um, until until I got married, um, I, from that time. Um, that my dad left Louisiana. Um, I lived the life of an evangelist kid and, um, and have seen just a lot of incredible things in, in ministry with my dad. And, um, just my whole life has, my whole life has been, has been, been this. Yes, sir. It, so, uh, in kingdom link, we're really, uh, our, our focus is about connecting generational leaders and generational ministries. So you have that Yes, sir. Life. And one of the cool things that one of the cool things that happened when when I was growing up um, um, uh, and became a preacher under my dad's ministry as he was evangelizing, um, my dad did something for me that I don't know that I've ever heard of another another evangelist doing with his son. But it, well, back in the first of all, back in that time, my dad was preaching. Uh, Eight, ten, twelve week revivals. That's that's that's, that's when five, we had marathons. <laughs> yeah, five nights a week. Sometimes I've been in seven night a week revivals, yes, and uh, for for months. Yeah, and but so when I started preaching, when we would go to a church, my dad would ask the local pastor if I could have one service a week to preach in the revival. Well, that's and awesome. So my dad would give me one night a week of revival to preach. That's awesome. And at the end of the week, whenever the pastor paid him, he would divide up the services, and he would give me my cut of the uh, my cut of the week's pay. Good. Uh, but part of the deal was is I had to put half of it in savings. Okay. And uh, I could do whatever I wanted to uh, with the other half. And it was also interesting too. Like we would be sitting on the platform. Uh, during service on my my service to preach and I'd I'd have my notebook there and I would be you know um, trying to feel my way through what I wanted yes, to sir. preach and uh, there was times my dad would would lean over and say son I think that this message would would go really good for this service tonight wow. and I would preach what 
so I he would preach he from was, my repertoire what he right, sometimes he was grooming he you yes, sir, to follow the to leading follow the of spirit yes sir. The, the, that that's fantastic no and, and so when i got when i got uh, out on my own i paid cash for my first travel trailer oh, when i started awesome. evangelizing because of because of, because of the off the half that he uh, wow, made me put in savings from my from the offerings that that's he gave fantastic me. who would you uh say uh besides your dad that had thank you some for of making most... that qualification okay it would be hard not to sure. start off with that well so. I, and i understand because um, my father was in ministry and uh it's it, he stands in a segment yeah. all by himself absolutely mm-hmm. and i would hope that any absolutely. any any uh, son of a of a preacher that's that the preacher was a man of integrity yes, and character. You 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 can't put them in the same category. No, no So not at who all. Uh, beside your dad uh, b- bore a great influence on your life? Uh, there were probably uh, uh, probably three three different preachers for three different reasons that okay. that really impacted. Uh, uh, how I preached and how I wanted to preach whenever I was new in ministry uh, growing up. Let's make it four. Uh, so the so the so the guy that the guy that I just like loved his revelation. I think he may have even I think he may have even made us coin the phrase revelatory preaching. Okay, and that's Jeff Arnold. Yeah. When I when I I don't even you know, think he, that, he was a lot deeper than people give oh, him credit absolutely. for. Absolutely. He was he was incredibly people get deep. distracted by the 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 uh, jerks and slobs and turkey comments yeah. and don't realize that there is powerful, rich yes, revelation right. in his absolutely. preaching. Absolutely. And I don't I don't think before Jeff Arnold uh came to the Pentecostal movement we even had a category called revelatory preaching. But he That's a very valid point. He he I in fact I've I've written a college paper about the impact of Jeff Arnold's ministry on wow. Pentecostalism. But <clears throat> so Jeff Arnold, I his revelation, his his the way he saw scripture, okay, just deeply impacted uh me in my early years of ministry. Now on the the very um the miraculous Pentecostal a supernatural kind of component of being Pentecostal. Uh-huh. I was a huge, I listened to hours and hours and hours of Lee Stone King when I was growing up. Yes, mm-hmm. sir. And then um, an independent uh, uh, an independent preacher in South Florida, whose name was Roger Evans, okay. was deeply impacted how I saw Bible teaching. Mm-hmm. He was That's probably, cool. even as a 15, 16-year-old kid, uh, this elder, when he taught, he captivated my mind, captivated my heart when he was when he was teaching the word of god mm-hmm. and then there was a uh, a preacher james swindle also an independent preacher uh that he kind of blended it was a it was a blend of he was very prophetic very used in the gifts okay but was also a phenomenal uh uh preacher at the same which is rare to have yes, it is. a guy who who operates powerfully in the gifts but is also a a sermonizer, a pulpiteersman, and he, mm-hmm. he blended both of those very well. That's fantastic. You know, the, the old saying is if you find a uh, turtle on top of a fence post, he didn't get there by no, himself. No, sir. Mm-hmm. And every one of us are um, impacted uh, who we are by the tributaries that flows into us. No doubt. Whatever whatever way that, that is. And we're excited to have you with us today. We're going to be talking to you about uh, your book. And uh, uh, David, if you would, let's start with that first segment and uh, launch into some questions about, are you a a Christian? Absolutely. So, and speaking of the book, uh, what do you believe uh, is the genesis origin of this book? Tell us about the process and the journey of how this book was developed in your life. Well, I was was with a a pastor friend of mine, um, and I watched him as he was making some journeys and decisions uh, for himself and his congregation. And I watched kind of the, the, the response of, of an extreme um, right-wing aspect of the apostolic movement and how they responded, responded to him because he was very popular in that particular arena of, of Pentecostalism. And it really grieved my spirit how I, how I saw them respond to my friend. And so it really stirred up in me that there has to be there has to be a christian balanced response mm-hmm. to 
to how we handle brotherly conflict and Absolutely. and how we see uh, a lot of the uh, issues that, as I say in the book, that may be, a, uh, may be a, not uh, essentially apostolic, but they are important to who we are as apostolics. Absolutely. And so right. how we handled those issues, watching all of that unfold is what gave birth to to the book. That's you know, awesome. the c- conflict in the church is not a new thing. No, it's no, not. No, because no, no. Paul had it with Peter. Yeah. And uh, I think healthy <coughs> conflict or healthy communication is important. It's that that unhealthiness mm-hmm. that creates Yeah, the, the demonization. The, the, yeah, the Absolutely. demonization, the the poison that can be poured out from that. Well, and also it, we see a lot that if somebody gets hurt in apostolic faith, a lot of times that pushes us away further from God. It does. But it was very interesting to see that even though you saw this hurt, that you used it to something to advance the kingdom. Yes, sir. You saw that you could do something for God through pain and through hurt. That was really awesome. Uh, in the first chapter, you write, and I quote, Growing up, I understood the term Christian to mean Christ-like. This is not, however, what the term Christian specifically means. To be a Christian is to be a follower of Christ. Being a follower of Christ does not mean that one is merely following Christ like the proverbial cart follows the horse. To be a follower of Christ means that one is adherent to the teachings and doctrines of Christ. So what are some ways the term Christian took on a new life for you and how following Jesus is at the heart of being a Christian? So we often hear, uh, we often hear the, at least I did growing up, the term Christian means to be Mm Christ-like. But uh, the point I make in the book is that uh, no matter how sanctified we become, no matter how holy or spiritual or prayerful or uh, how much we fast uh, and pray or whatever, there will be a dimension of being like Christ that we will never attain until the resurrection. Mm. That there's mm. a dimension of Christ likeness. No matter how spiritual mm. I get, let's just face it, I'm never going to walk on right. water in, yes. this, in this lifetime. Mm. I'm never going to take a, a loaf of sunbeam and, and sardines and feed 5,000 people. <laughs> right? It, it's just <laughs> not going to happen. There's a right. dimension of Christ likeness that I will never, ever walk in. Yeah. So if the goal of being Christ, if Christian means to be Christ-like, then no one is ever going to be a Christian. Mm. No mm. one is ever going to, to measure up to um, to being a Christian. But the term Christian means to, to follow the teachings of Christ, that a Christian is one who seeks to obey what Christ taught. It's the same way with mo- a lot of modern denominations. Uh, but we call them Lutherans. Mm-hmm. Why? Because they are following uh, a creedal, a creedal uh, uh, dogma from Martin Luther. Mm-hmm. Or our Wesleyans mm-hmm. right. are, are following after a certain set of teachings, from, right. John, teachings right. from John Wesley. And so to be a Christian means that we are seeking to adhere to, follow uh, the, the teachings of Christ. It doesn't mean that we always measure up to... Every day I live perfectly what Christ taught, but the goal is that um, through the through the process of sanctification by the work of the Spirit in my heart, that the goal is to live up to and measure up to the teachings of Christ. And as I also point out in that chapter, we're not talking about the teachings of Christ as opposed to the teachings of the uh, the apostles. We know what Christ taught in large part because. He he handed off that teaching. Right, um, right, right. Jesus uh, said, "I pray not for for these only, but for all them that will believe, believe on me believe. through their yeah. word." That's right. Absolutely. And so, when we say Christian, I don't mean to say Christian as opposed to the apostles. The term apostolic and Christian are uh, synonymous, um, at least in my head, because what the apostles taught was a faithful um, was a faithful. Uh, commitment to the teachings of Jesus. Right. That's right. awesome. That's awesome. Uh, a follow-up question is that is, uh, you mentioned in uh, your book as well, uh, why do you believe that the Bible only refers to the term Christian three times? Well, it only uses the term Christian specifically um, three times, which is in Acts eleven twenty six. He says that they were first called Christians at Antioch. Mm-hmm. Um, Acts 26, 28, um, almost thou persuadest me yeah, to, to be, be a, a Christian, Christian. Right. and then First Peter four sixteen. If any man suffer as a Christian, right. it is mm-hmm. a it is a thankworthy thing. Now the term Christian 
uh, is only used specifically uh, as a term three times, but uh, the call to follow Christ that's multiple Absolutely. is is yeah. is it's repeated. Full. So Absolutely. if the term Christian means to be a follower of Christ, anytime you have the call to follow Christ mm-hmm. in Scripture, you have that call yeah. to be a mm-hmm. Christian. So it's so take up your yeah, it's right. implicitly, implicitly, implicitly through it. Yeah. Yep. So take up your cross and follow me. That yes. is an appeal to be a Christian. Yeah. Um, yeah. When he tells the fishermen to abandon their nets and boats and that's, follow me, that's technically that's that's, that's what right. that's being a Christian. Right. It's Absolutely. Just that's, that's good. By Christ. That's awesome. So here's a really interesting question. Why is it in today's world when we think of the term Christian, we usually think of someone who is non denominational? <clears throat> you know, I, I to be honest with you, I don't know why that uh, apostolics have such um, an aversion to the term Christian. Um, I, I guess I, I could surmise that because of the emphasis that we place on separation mm-hmm. as apostolics, that because of the rest of the world identifies us as Christian, we have to have this kind of niche label mm-hmm. that sets us apart from everybody else. So we're not Christian, we're apostolic, which is a very, very unfortunate. Right, very, absolutely. Because it's a, it's possible to adhere to the creeds of the apostles, but not have the character of Christ. That's right. Mm. And so I don't want to just be apostolic. I want to be a Christian. I want to be a Christ follower. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the, the, uh, that's a good, you mentioned apostolic and brought that in. Let's, let's take a look over jumping ahead. Let me see your book there, uh, right quick. If, if you, if you want to get this book as well, we're, we're going to be talking about a giveaway that we're having, but also you, we want to make sure you know that you can go to Amazon and download this book. I believe every believer needs this book. Absolutely. Whether you call yourself apostolic or not, you need it. This Absolutely. is a great, great book. But chapter four stands out to me like a uh, like the, the the sandwich of your chapters. Okay. Yeah. It's a really part of the meat. Everything's great, but yeah. to me, it, it because of, uh, of the identification I see in it, it's called labels and secondary labels is what it the. I believe your chapter's title. Yeah, it's called Secondary Labels. Uh, you open the chapter with this. You say, the term apostolic is a chief label. While I accept and embrace the term apostolic, when properly defined, it has become a very abused and misused label. The term apostolic means uh, of or relating to the teaching or practice of the apostles. I certainly affirm the teaching of the apostles, yet it is possible, you say, to hold the creed of the apostles, but not the character of Christ. The oneness of God is the fun, is, a, is the fundamental apostolic and Christian creed, but the demons also believe that God is one, and they tremble. Uh, the primary question is, are you a Christian? So that, that brings me to a thought. Address for us how you see the present-day Pentecostal movement so misusing this term, apostolic. So it, it I, I think it might be in your your notes. Mm-hmm. Uh, that we'll we will talk. I think I'll talk about overbranding here in a moment. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. but but I also uh, make a statement in there that uh, we've reduced the term apostolic down to like a sheet of Avery labels that we just mm. peel off peel and off, stick, stick on, on right. yeah, stick on something that we want to use as a uh, identifier to separate us from. Yeah. And, and I've made the statement in conversation or even preaching, I think, last night that too often many of our standards are designed to separate us from other Christians and not more the world. More than the world. Right. Yeah. More, more than the world. Yeah. And so, uh, so the term apostolic, I think how we have abused it is we have taken it outside of what it really means. And that is is of or relating to the teachings or practices of the apostles. So so the point is, is that if the apostles didn't teach it or practice it, mm-hmm. then we can't call it apostolic. Mm. Say that again. If the apostles didn't teach it didn't teach or it. practice it, or practice it, we can't call it apostolic. That's good. And so yeah. and so, where I was raised, where I was, as you can tell, I get ex- I, I get, <laughs> get animated. I get animated about this topic. <laughs> Go on, brother. Go on, so brother. so where I was raised, we stuck the label of apostolic on all kinds of things. That's not oh, an yeah. apostolic necktie. Mm. That's not an apostolic haircut. That's not mm. an apostolic suit. Those are not apostolic shoes. That's not an apostolic dress. Right. Well, 
first of all, you know, to like I said, to label it apostolic, you have to ask yourself, what did the apostles teach or practice mm. concerning that issue? And if you can't demonstrate what they taught or practiced about it, then it's not apostolic. Okay. And Come so, so okay. the question I would have, so the question I would have about your about your haircut is like, is that an apostolic haircut? Well, what kind of haircut did the apostles have? I think everybody needs this apostolic yeah, haircut. Exactly. Uh, by the way, if you're not watching, I'm bald. And, yeah. uh, Very bald. And I've got great hair. It's like heaven. <laughs> his, his, head, his head is like heaven. There's no parting up There's there. No, it's it's no. very, very, very heavy. Actually, it's a wide part. <laughs> <laughs> very wide part. It, 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 but so, the, so did the apostles, like, did they go down to the local Jerusalem Great Clips? <laughs> and, and get a number three on the side and tapered in the back. Right. I mean, right. It, exactly what is an apostolic haircut? So when we talk about the issue of hair, the only thing that the Bible tells us about a man's hair is that it shouldn't be long. Mm-hmm. Right. Anything after that is your opinion. It's not apostolic. Yes. So there's no stylistic parameters in mm. Scripture to tell you Parted left or parted right, parted right. middle, combed straight back. What's an apostolic hairstyle? Mm. And 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 f- for me, I think we're living in a culture where, okay, I am by by genetics and by birth, my DNA is that I'm Welsh, Scottish, mm-hmm. Indian. <laughs> okay, I I have uh, my great grandmother was full blooded Cherokee Indian. Wow. So. I've got these different things. So am I supposed to, in today's world, I need to be hyphenating my whole name yeah. to be that this is who I am. No, I am a Christian, I'm a Christian. that happens to be Welch, Scottish, yes, sir. Indian. That's right. You know, mm. who's got blind eyes and no hair. But in, 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 in the desire to, to, to identify ourselves, we often, I think, crave that apostolic label to where we have become guilty, in my opinion, of making it a denominal name yes, right. more than a true identifier. Mm-hmm. That's true. Well, okay. and, and I think one thing about that is that we think that putting something like apostolic on it makes it so powerful. There is no other name to be labeled like than Christ. That's right. right. I mean, there's nothing that I want to be like to have you know, be like Christ, have that in my name. Why would I want anything else besides Mm -hmm. Jesus? And so, so what we do is we run the risk of calling so many things apostolic that we dilute it, that it actually cheapens the label. Yes. So, so won't, won't like, for example, that's not an apostolic suit. Mm. You know, yeah. Well, you want to wear an apostle suit <laughs> because you would be wearing sandals and yes. robes and, a, and a skirt. Yeah. Okay. Let's not go there. <laughs> so, so no, an I apostolic suit, an apostolic suit doesn't exist. It's true. So right. that's the point. When we place it on everything, it cheapens. When we say, Absolutely. "Okay, baptism in Jesus' name is apostolic." That's, that's apostolic. Mm, yes. The oneness of God, that's apostolic. Absolutely. But when I say that baptism in Jesus' name is apostolic, and also say the kind of haircut that you have is apostolic, mm. then I'm cheapening that's, the value that's and good. the importance of the oneness of God yes, and sir. baptism in Jesus' yes, name. That's good. Matter of fact, that, uh, in your book, you, you cover, and uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read. You can go buy the book and read it. It's a but, fantastic uh, book. <laughs> but here, here's something that you talk about in there. Uh, and that is the danger of adding to and taking away from Scripture. And uh, uh, give us an example of the apostolic movement. And I want to reaffirm very clearly that this book does not uh, attack being apostolic. No, no, Matter of no, fact, no. it illuminates. It, uh, it's in defense of being truly, truly apostolic. apostolic. And when I say yeah, redefining apostolic, yeah, a lot of guys are put off by the, the language of redefining apostolic as though, I'm trying to Change twist it, it to twist make it, it something that it isn't. Right. So to redefine simply means to define again. To define again. So when again, I talk right. about mm, redefining apostolic, I'm saying let's take it back. Okay. Let's, let's take another look at it and see what it what it meant originally, originally to be apostolic. So what I'm after is being original apostolic. Right. All right, we're talking about your chapter on labels. And in chapter four, uh, if I may just read a few paragraphs here, uh, you make the statement, quote, only the foundational apostles have the authority to bind doctrine on the church. 
We only have missional apostles. We have no foundational apostles. We have preachers that fulfill the mission of an apostle to plant churches where Christ is is not yet named, uh, Romans 15, 20. But we have no preacher whose teachings are infallible. None of us can write epistles or teach doctrines with uh, canonical authority. Uh, you also mention in in your book about the danger of adding to and taking away. Let me combine a couple questions here. Okay. First of all, uh, expand a little bit on what you mean by adding to or taking away. And then also, if you would, talk about the difference uh, between foundational apostles and missional apostles. I think it's a powerful, powerful distinction. Okay, so first of all, what the distinction I make between foundational apostles and missional apostles is I think that uh, the the twelve apostles were had a unique role mm-hmm. in uh, establishing the new covenant, establishing uh, doctrine and teaching for right. for the for the new covenant. I do not think that anybody alive today operates on the unique the level of unique authority mm-hmm. that those foundational. Uh, apostles operated. So in other words, I don't have the authority to add to the canon of Scripture. I Nothing I write, including, and especially this book, is mm-hmm. on the level of Scripture. Mm-hmm. Right. Nothing right. I write carries the authority or the weight mm-hmm. of the Apostle the apostle Paul or any of the other yes. apostles, for that matter. Yes, sir. But uh, we do carry out, I think, the same mission of the apostles. Paul made the statement, the the text that you referenced was that, I go where Christ is not yet named, lest I build on another man's foundation. So the the mission of an apostle to establish establish churches, to to preach the gospel (coughs) in places that have never heard the gospel, we still still carry out that, that missional, uh, that missional or functional aspect of mm. of apostolicity, but and, not. And, and also, you you mentioned the the twelve apostles. So you classify uh, Paul as as then that special designated apostle. Yes, uh, I, I, I. So yes, that's uh, a that's clarify. a huge. There's a huge. That. I do that it was going to either come from you <laughs> or somebody was going to post that in the comments yes. on my yeah, YouTube I, channel. And so I, um, I I think that. That Paul was the the ultimate the ultimate twelfth apostle, the ultimate mm, right. replacement of Judas. apostle for for Judas. I like that. I That's think good. I think um, um, help me out here. I can't believe my mind just went blank. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matthias. Matthias. Oh, thank I you. Th- say Math- th- Math- th- Matthias. <laughs> thank- and I knew that wasn't right. <laughs> thank you, Father, for helping me right here in front of the whole world to remember Matthias. I didn't want to look stupid here about this this whole conversation. I th- and and a lot a lot of my friends are going to challenge this. This is a debate that's happened in Bible colleges, right. et cetera, et cetera. I think I think Matthias was a transitory a okay. filler apostle. Okay. Until yeah, Paul, who was born, he says, as one born out of due season. I think, right. I think Paul was that ultimate, that ultimate final twelfth apostle to replace right. to replace Judas. I think, and, and we can't say that Paul was writing infallible scripture, inspired by God, and then take out the fact that he was classified by himself mm-hmm. and by scripture to yeah, be an apostle. Absolutely. And so, okay, let's let's talk about that that aspect of adding to. Are taken away from Scripture. So it's the terminology is both in Deuteronomy and in the Book of Revelation. Right. So, so the idea of not adding to the words of this law is, or taking away from it is in the Book of Deuteronomy. And then uh, John kind of takes that language from the law and applies it to the Book of, of Revelation. Yes, sir. If any man adds unto the words of the prophecy of this book. He will add unto him the plagues that are written there, and if any man takes away from the words of the prophecy, he'll take away his name out of the book of life. That's pretty strong stuff. Oh, that's pretty. And so pretty strong. So statement. so the way I see adding to or taking away from the word of God is when we add commandments to the scriptures as essential for salvation mm-hmm. that are not written in scripture, then we have added to the word of God. Mm. Or when we say that something that Scripture c- 
commands is yeah. not necessary, then right. we have taken away from uh, the Word of God. You know, it's it just seems like that sometimes we don't even stop and think that you know, the Lord said, you know, our words have power. Yeah, right. Okay, and even as men of God that preach the Word of God, our words carry such great weight. They do. Oh, and yeah. we need to be careful. Yeah. Uh, by the way, join our next podcast with Pastor Carol. We're going to be talking about Herm uh, hermeneutics. Yeah. But if we're not careful, we can just really take things too far mm -hmm. or remove something that, that we should have left in there. And a Absolutely. perfect yeah. example of, of a friend, he's a friend of mine, um, and he'll know who I'm talking about if he happens to hear or see this podcast. Yeah. Uh, but he makes the statement, he, he has made the statement that you might not. You might be able to go to heaven doing a certain thing, mm -hmm. but you can't go to heaven from my church and do that. Hmm. And I'm thinking, wow. no, wow. we do not have the authority Absolutely to not. go beyond Scripture in that kind of way. You can't say yeah. that you can go to heaven and do that, but you can't go to heaven in my church mm. and do that. Well, so that's, that's almost playing God. Uh, I know. First well, of all, yeah. I didn't know you had a church. Second of all, <laughs> that's why, exactly what I wanted to ask. Second, just, second of yeah. all, why would you want to make membership in your church stricter than God makes membership for heaven? Hmm. Well, and, and and what has happened a lot of times is that there has been such backtracking because uh, I ran into a situation where you know a a particular pastor, let's just take a, a simple snippet, was incredibly adamant. It's a sin. Do not play with cards. Yeah. Okay. Do not play with cards. Only later to see on his computer him playing solitaire. Yeah. With cards. So what happens is that. We create a mentality of backtracking from, yes. okay, that was an absolute. Now it's not. So other things that are absolutes are so, up in the air. So he went all in on that theology. <laughs> and then later he had to, later he had to fold. <laughs> Gee, and then he flushed that, that idea out there. Out there. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, we flushed that. You flushed that out. That's, oh, so, so, so now we have to get that straight. Yes. Right, yeah. What words? Because he's man, gambling with his theology. Oh, here. Yeah, let's let's <laughs> glory to God. Let's digress from that just for a few minutes. <laughs> uh, let's let's move into a. Uh, it's it's a language we often hear, and that is conservative and liberal. Yes, sir. Mm. Uh, you mentioned that Paul taught and explained the issues of liberty and charity in Romans chapter fourteen. Absolutely, one of the most powerful chapters in Romans, and. Uh, I believe in, in that chapter is where Paul answers the perplexing questions of neutralities and yeah. things that we uh, all issues. Talking about level, labels, there's a pretty big gulf between some ultra-conservative and extremely liberal. How have you experienced some of those differences, and uh, how is it possible to fellowship with both? It well, seems like in today's world, they're just so cutthroat. They hate yeah. each other. It seems like that. It does. And as we will maybe talk about in a moment, there are, I think, huge parallels between political conservatism and liberalism and religious conservatism yeah, go ahead, and liberalism. Go ahead and, and expand on that. <laughs> well, first, uh, first let me say, uh, I've at some point in my ministry, I've preached, I've preached in every demographic of Pentecost. I've preached in churches that we would consider, and I'll talk about why I think this is not necessarily accurate language in a moment, but what we traditionally consider to be the most liberal of churches, mm -hmm. I've I've preached in those churches. I've also preached in the most conservative mm -hmm. of churches and everything in between. Within a calendar month when I was evangelizing, I preached in an AMF church, I preached in a UPC church, I preached in a WPF church, I preached in an ALJC church, a PAW church. Hello. And I think that's I, every label. That's, and, and, that's alphabet that's soup right there. <laughs> and I think I preached in a Kojic church. A Kojic. In that wow, in good. that calendar month. So <laughs> I does just that to make demonstrate your head, head it does. <laughs> just to just to illustrate the point, I've preached in every demographic of Pentecostalism. Okay. And so I think the way that you have to be able to approach it is you have, we have to ask ourselves, what, what, is, what fundamentally makes someone my brother or sister in Christ? Yeah. 
what is that foundational fundamental level where I can say you're my brother, you're my sister. Yeah. And to for me, now this isn't ideally where I think people should live or the ultimate goal of where I think we should stop. But if you have the name of Christ and the spirit of Christ, yeah. mm. you are my brother in Christ. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so be I, I'm not saying that's the that's the minimum we should shoot for. I, I'm not saying that all you should want is baptism in Jesus' name and the Holy Ghost and nothing right. else matters because other things do matter. Yes, right. they do. But at that point you are my brother in Christ. Yeah. Right. And I, I, I think that is a found, fantastic explanation. And again, what what we call conservative sometime is really a, a, a mask to hide behind uh, uh, questions we can't answer. That's right. Mm-hmm. Questions we can't answer. And what hides behind a liberal sometimes is the spirit of co- uh of of co- condescension yeah you know one uh will will condemn and one condescends yeah, that's right. incredible and i i think that god wants us to understand that uh you know when we all get to heaven yeah as my dad used to say we're gonna be surprised who's there and surprised who's surprised who's, who's not there. Right. that's exactly right. right so but i think we often uh miss the whole conservative uh, conservative liberal concept as well, because making the parallel between relig- uh, religious, how we use those terms in a religious context and a political t- context. Yeah. Political conservatives are those who, a part of our nation, go back and use the Constitution as the the founding documents of our nation, and that we have... Uh, what Scalia would call an originalist approach to the Constitution. Right. What did the original founders, pen, those who penned the Constitution, what was the original intent that they had for that language? And what we do in our nation is confined to and restricted by the original intent of, of the founders and those who wrote the Constitution. Whereas liberals or progressives do not care so much about original intent. They view the Constitution as a morphing, evolving, mm-hmm. evolving yeah. document to where what the what the founders intended by it isn't that important. So they take liberties with the right. Constitution right. that right. the 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 writers of the Constitution didn't intend. And so putting that in the context of religion as the holy nation, our founding documents, our constitution is are the scriptures. Mm-hmm. And so a conservative is the one that says, what did the writers of the Bible intend? What was the original intent? Mm-hmm. And we are confined by original intent. We are conserving, not 1950, but 8050. Right. Mm-hmm. We're conserving the original intent. intent. Right. And we don't want to take liberties with the Constitution that yeah. our Constitution that wasn't intended by right. by the uh our our founding fathers, the apostles. That's awesome. I, I think that's a fantastic uh, understanding between liberal and uh conservative. In in the in the atmosphere of this current age, they have moved us, at least some have, moved us from Postmodern, we're we're no longer postmodern. We're actually called post-truth. Mm. So there is a sh- seismic shift going on in our culture of all kinds of religions coming in, all kinds of uh, beliefs coming in, and I feel like that sometimes that has shifted and and sifted rather its way into the the Christian Church, the Apostolic Church, and how do we how do we protect ourselves? from falling prey to that vacuum that says you need change. It, 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 because here, here's the thing that you started off by telling your story about watching a friend dealing with, yeah. dealing with this, this shift and dealing with all this. And we need to sit down and study the Word. Yeah, absolutely. But I think there's a lot of guys and a lot of pastors that hold on to something that is... Okay, this is apostolic, but it's not in the book. But they yeah. hold on to it because they're so afraid yeah. mm. that if they let go of that, they're going to go like the pendulum and swing all the way and, to right. the other side. And I think originalism. I think, I think going back to the original intent of Scripture and not being swayed by culture is the answer. Mm. Okay. So being conservative says, 
So being conservative says I'm conserving the original intent of, yeah. of the Holy Scriptures, no matter what that looks like in the culture. However, mm. much of our approach in the apostolic movement isn't, we don't have a consistent epistemology. We don't have a consistent place from which we 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 get our knowledge that informs mm. what right. we do about certain right. things. So on the issue of, 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 say, facial hair, just to use it as an example, we use culture as the standard. Okay. Wow for making whether or not men should shave. So because hippies had beards, right. the culture became the standard right. for saying we shouldn't have beards. Whereas a topic like homosexuality, culture is not the standard. We use scripture as the standard. Mm -hmm. And I'm right. saying that our standard needs to be the same across the board. Systematic. It needs to be mm -hmm. a, a, a We need to have theology. a systematic theology, Absolutely. a systematic standard that whether we're talking about homosexuality or facial hair, the standard has to be the constitution of our holy nation. Mm -hmm. It has to be about originalism, no matter what topic we are addressing. And if we will do that, we can say we can approach every issue from the same from the same basis. And in the deep south they still do it. We still do it with interracial marriage. Scripture's not our standard about it. Culture, Culture is our standard yeah. about it. And so we create this uh conflict in the conscience of the people of God yes. that that culture is the standard on one thing, but yet right. scripture is the standard on the other thing. Well you make a statement in your book that I think it's just absolutely fantastic that there are two phrases that should never go together. <laughs> this is apostolic, and I do not have Bible for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a, that is a so powerful if, quote. if we think that we can say on this subject, you said you mentioned beards. If we could say, oh, we believe one way about this. Well, I don't quite have Bible for it. Yeah. And then we go on to another topic like homosexuality. Well, we do have Bible for yeah. it. How do we justify that? How do we say, mm -hmm. well... The reason I say this is because, well, really, it's just my opinion, and that's what mm -hmm. we've been taught for so many years, whereas this, this is Holy Scripture, infallible Word of God. And so based it on the conservative liberal component, bringing that into what we're talking about, yeah. actually, it isn't conservative to say you will go to hell for facial hair. That's liberal. Wow, you just—you just, you just come on, somebody's say, theology right yeah, there. Say it because again for the because the if if I'm conserving original intent of yeah. of our documents, yeah. that's not a conservative position. You're now taking liberal a liberal approach to where we impose we impose mm -hmm. non constitutional restrictions, yeah, right, up on the holy nation that that's not in the original documents. And so to do that's that good. is liberal, it's not conservative. So when I say the Bible doesn't prohibit that, that's not a liberal position, that's a conservative position. Okay, that's gonna make us do some thinking. That's uh, awesome. I wanna add one little caveat to that, Okay, and then we'll move on. Paul in Romans 14 called the conservative weak, Oh yes. and he called the liberal <laughs> Uh, yeah, strong. The brother, the brother with the most restrictions was the was the weak brother. The yes. one with yeah. the most liberties Absolutely. was the strong brother. That doesn't brother. mean right or wrong, y'all. That no. doesn't mean necessarily no, taking a all. position of right or wrong, because I do think that we've got to go back to the original intent about you know. Again, you used the example facial hair because there's plenty of text to follow that. There are some things that there's not. That's so right. we need to handle them within and, the context so, of our community. Absolutely. So let me be. Culture. So let me be clear. Let me be clear that when I say originalism with the New Testament, so when the Bible speaks about an issue, yes. when the Bible addresses an issue, then then um, the Bible is the should be the sole infallible authority related to that to topic. that issue. Where the Bible does not address yep. an issue. Then we we live out biblical principles and mm. apply them within our particular Absolutely. within right. our particular context. Absolutely. So it doesn't mean that you can't preach anything outside of what is just no. We expressed. but we we just but have, we but we ahead. better have a good premise and yes. principle to back it up and state it for what it is. Yes, state it for what it is. Like like Paul did with uh, with marrying. It's good for the present distress, so yes. to be. And yeah. so, so <laughs> when we when we put that in context, say, hey, brothers and sisters, the Bible does not demand this, mm -hmm. but but wisdom mm. 
expects yeah. this from us in right. this particular context for this particular period of time. Absolutely. And be honest with that. And be front. honest for, for for what it is. Yeah. If you are going to preach against facial hair in uh, as a platform standard or even a church-wide standard, be honest enough to say what it is. Don't Absolutely. pretend like right. it. And people will follow that. Yes, Absolutely. they will. Don't they will follow that if you if you have a certain uh you know it, it, it we were blessed to pastor uh, four different churches. We have been blessed. We're, 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 we're certainly honored with that. But I found that in each church, there were particular things I had to deal with more extremely yeah. and extensively Absolutely. than I did in others. Yes. Because of the spiritual dominion that was there or yeah. because of the particular regional problems, influence, regional influences mm-hmm. that were there. Uh, that moves us into something very related to that and that your book covers uh, the discussion of conscience and convictions. Yes, sir. Explain a little bit the difference between conscience and convictions and how you see that. Well, I I see I see that in the conscience there is there is uh I think multiple levels of knowledge. Mm-hmm. And so when when Paul is talking in 1 Corinthians 8 um when Paul is my wife just uh Text me and told me she loved me, and I definitely love her too. So okay. that's awesome. That's what that sound was. God what... bless you, sister. God Carol, bless you. That's right. So Paul talks about First Corinthians eight six, mm-hmm. to, writing to the Corinthians in the dispute about eating things sacrificed to idols. Right. He says um, the idol is nothing in the world, for there is none other god but one. Right. And then he follows it up with a statement that blew my mind when I was studying the text. He said, "How be it? There is not in every man that knowledge." Mm. Mm. Who is he writing to? He's writing to people who are Christians, people who had already converted. Right. And he's saying that these converted Christians who do not have the ability in their conscience to eat something sacrificed to an wow. idol, which is completely permissible because the idol is nothing. There's none of the God but one. He says some have that knowledge. Others don't have that mm-hmm. knowledge. What knowledge? That there's none of the God but one. So you mean to tell me there are Christians... People who are post-converted, mm. they went from paganism to Christianity, and they don't know that there's none other God but one? Of mm. course they do. That's what baptism in Jesus' name was in the first century. It was a confession of Jesus yes, Christ as awesome. Lord. Yeah. It's confession that that He is the one and only Lord. Caesar is not Lord. Yeah, right. No one else is Lord. Jesus is Lord. So what do you mean in their knowledge mm. that they don't... There's not in every man that knowledge. Well, they had to have the intellectual knowledge. Right. That there's none of the God but one. Right. But they didn't have the emotional mm. knowledge. That intellectual knowledge had not yet affected their conscience. Their conscience, when they ate something sacrificed to idols, that idol was still in their conscience. Okay. And so they were theologically a monotheist, but in their wow. conscience, they were still polytheists. Kind of like Israel coming out of Egypt. They, yes, they were they emancipated. Still That's right. Naturally and f- physically, but they were not in their mind. There's right. theological knowledge and then there's emotional knowledge okay. called the conscience. Okay. And so what happens when this brother in the case of 1 Corinthians has the liberty to eat something sacrificed to idols. Okay. Yet his conscience will not allow him to do it in full faith. Okay. And so he should not. I believe what Paul is saying, he should not eat that thing. Mm-hmm. That he is perfectly at lib- at liberty to eat until his conscience, his emotional knowledge, Has catches matched. up mm-hmm. with his theological mm-hmm. knowledge. Uh, that that would fall then under the concept of of. Christian so he discipleship, has, that's maturity, right. Right. That's right. sanctification, that's right, and those kinds of. And so concepts. he has a conviction against eating Kentucky Fried Chicken that's been sacrificed to that great. Uh, chicken God, the Colonel, the Colonel, the Colonel Sanders, Colonel. the great Chicken God, so, Colonel Sanders. Right. So he has a conviction against right. that because his conscience has not grown to the place to where, in his conscience, he is convinced mm-hmm. the idol is nothing, mm-hmm. that there's none other God but one. Mm-hmm. And Paul grabs a phrase that's used repeatedly throughout the Old Testament and even in the New Testament that I find absolutely incredible. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Yeah. And so what he is saying, that concept of the oneness of God is 
that even though this chicken was sacrificed by a pagan mm. to a non-existent idol, the earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. Even though that chicken was sacrificed to Colonel, the great chicken god, Colonel Sanders, <laughs> God created that chicken. Come and on. from a strong conscience, I can, as a, as, a, uh, as a person who the oneness of God has affected not only my theology but my conscience, I can say, no, that's God's chicken. I'm God's child, and God's child's going to eat God's chicken. It doesn't matter who a pagan sacrificed it to. That that's God awesome. didn't exist, yeah. so it didn't create that chicken. That's, awesome. that's, a, that's a very clear uh, awesome. directive in answering that question. I certainly do appreciate that. Um, why do you think so many churches have... Uh, change their views to compromise and go radically. We've talked about the radical right or the conservative, but yeah. what, what, what is it that has caused folks to go so radically left? I think, I think people, I think people do the other, the other wrong thing is that they get an intellectual understanding mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that something is permitted, but their conscience hasn't, Yet, so it's a it's reverse. A, it's a reverse of it's that reverse process. It's a reverse of that process. And wow. so, what it is is the conscience does not have the ability to uh-huh. distinguish between whether it's violated to do something right mm. or violated to do something wrong. Okay, do you understand mm. what I'm saying? Yeah. So the person that has a conviction against eating that chicken offered to Colonel Sanders, yeah. if they do it, they violate their conscience to do it. Okay. Even though they violated their conscience to do something that was okay. But the conscience doesn't have the ability to decide, okay, I was violated to do something right mm. and to and to make the distinction between I was violated to do something wrong. Wow. So the only thing it knows is that it was violated. Wow. And so when you violate the conscience, even to do something that's permissible, yeah, you open the conscience up to be violated to do things that are wrong. Wow. And so when people do not, when they transition... Yeah. into Christian liberty, too often they don't do it with conscience and faith. And so what they end up doing is they end up violating things that are truly against the law of God. And they don't have the ability, ability in their conscience to stop that process. So it, it's it's a very uh, important for us to stay uh, balanced. I'm trying yes. to look at, look, listen, get in my mind for a really good theological word for balance because I don't like the word balance. Yeah. Uh, it's a misnomer, but I do think it's very important to be um, in the middle blended. of the road, to where you know you're not going so far right or so far left. Yeah. And I realize people say, "Oh, you're just a compromiser if that's the way you're going to go." But I had rather yeah. not be pulled too far to yeah. one side or another. Right. And and keep my uh, uh, conscious in that particular way. So that I'm not violated yeah. in the, on the right or oh, on that's the left. Right. Absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. I'm not talking about correct. convictions and doctrine. Yeah. I'm grabbing those with everything. Yeah, absolutely. The, absolutely. The Bible says we're not it. again. We're not talking about core commandments of right. Scripture. Exactly. We're talking about secondary secondary issues and, that. And right. uh, I'll mention this, and then uh, we'll move on. But uh, I, I talked to you earlier about. The, walking around Mount Zion and seeing the, the the bulwarks and the walls and the wall, the walls of the city refer to the immovable things of, right. of Scripture. Yeah, and then bulwarks are portable uh, defenses mm-hmm. that could be moved, whether mounds of dirt or you know uh, stockpiles of something, uh, bob wire that we could talk about in World War II or wherever the case may be. But it was to imp- to slow down the impeding forces. If they had a maze, they had to go through yeah, or something right. of that nature. Slow them down. But it was not a immovable wall. Yeah. No. And so whatever battle you're battling, whatever that enemy is, you may have, you, to, you adjust. May have to adjust your bulwark right. yes. to go out and meet him further. Right. That's right. And then you could bring it back mm-hmm. at a point in time where yeah. you're not dealing with that particular enemy. So in times of peace, bulwarks can be closer, closer. than what they are in times of in war. Time absolutely. Of war. We're having a great time today yeah. on this podcast with uh, Pastor John Carroll, and we've been we're talking about his book, "Are You a Christian?" And if you don't have this book, you need to go uh, to Amazon, and you can purchase it in a physical copy like this, or download with the Kindle edition. We are also going to be giving away a copy, and if you would like to have the giveaway copy, here's how you do it. 
go to our post that will have this picture and our podcast uh, about this and uh, go to our post on our Facebook page, Kingdom Link Podcast, and uh, uh, make a comment. And if you have not subscribed to Forward Talk, go to uh, YouTube and subscribe to his YouTube channel, uh, Pastor Carroll's YouTube channel. And then also go and subscribe to Let's uh, Talk on any service provider out there, uh, whether it be Podbean or iTunes or iHeartRadio. And so uh, we're just having a great time yes, talking about this topic. And uh, let's let's talk about David. Let's let's look at the uh, next segment in, in this book, and that is laws, traditions, and questions, and whatever else comes up. Absolutely. So in chapter 7, you wrote, Law and traditions utterly fail to produce the righteousness of God. Man never has, nor will ever be able to, uh, excuse me, nor will ever be made righteous by law. So Paul said that law was spiritual in Romans 7 and 14. How can it be like our teacher, but not make us righteous? Well, um, the thing about the thing about the law of God that cannot, that cannot be, um, cannot make us uh, righteous and perhaps um, maybe a, a larger uh, context of what I was writing there is law imposed as an external force. Okay. Mm. So you're so, not specifically talking about no, the, the Mosaic law no. in your book there? Yeah. I'm talk, what, I'm, what I mean is, is that law as an external code, law that was written, okay. written on stone, that it's simply... It's simply a legal document okay. is incapable of producing righteousness. So the only way that law can produce righteousness is when that law of God is by the Spirit written in our hearts. There you go. That the law of God writes mm. that on yeah. the tables of our heart, the fleshly tables of the heart. So if law is merely a, co- a penal code, if law is merely a legal document, if if what we are demanding of people is simply something that's that's pen and ink, something that we are po- imposing on them uh, externally as a rule that they must comply with, that can never make a person righteous. If yeah. it could, the death penalty for committing adultery in the Old Testament <laughs> would, would have, have kept it. would have kept people <laughs> from committing. There's it. not a more but severe. No, people nope. were willing to die. Wow, to wow. commit adultery. Yeah. Law yeah. cannot make one righteous. No. So, so, so I just want to give a, a little fuller context to what I was saying about that. So, the the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is not the righteousness of the law; it's how that righteousness of the law is obtained. Mm-hmm. And Paul says that the righteousness of the law, which is by faith, right. right. So the the righteousness of the law, the goal of righteousness has not changed. Thou shalt not commit adultery is still the righteousness of the law. Right. It's still the goal of the law of God. Yeah. But it can't make you righteous as an external code. It has to be by the Spirit written in our hearts Absolutely. and that the law of God flows outwardly rather than being imposed externally. You know, right. uh, it, it's interesting to me, Jesus, when he began to lay down his basic treaties on on kingdom understanding in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Yes, sir. When he began to lay those out, he said, you have heard it said. Yeah, but I say. But I say unto right. you. That's right. So what he did is that he took the law to its level of intent. Yes. Mm-hmm. And But he also knew that when it came to Calvary, he was going to pay the price yeah. and provide his spirit yes. so that through Christ and by his spirit, we can fulfill the intent of the law. That's right. The the righteous, the intent. righteous of the, the righteousness of the law. That's yeah, exactly fulfill right. Fulfill that intent because in that the law is spiritual. Yes, it is because it brings us to the follower of Christ. That's right. Be right. the follower of Christ. And so, so external rules, no matter how righteous they are, no matter how true they are, if it's nothing but a rule, mm. it will never produce the righteousness no. of God. The right. only thing that produces the righteousness of God is faith by the Spirit. And and traditions, traditions, human traditions can can never produce the righteousness no. of God. No, not at all. No matter whether they flow out of the heart or whether mm, they're right. imposed externally or whatever, right. human traditions simply in no form or fashion is able to produce well, the Jesus righteousness of God. Well, Jesus said that the traditions of the Pharisees made the word of God of none, none effect. effect. 
Mm-hmm. And so it just destroyed the authority of the it, scripture it, by it, their by their tradition. It completely mm-hmm. invalidates the right. very thing that's intended Absolutely. to make us right. righteous. Absolutely. And so it's it's incredible Galatians, Paul makes the statement that and we often call adultery fornication, lasciviousness, all the stuff that Paul listed in Galatians, what is it, Galatians 4? Galatians, no, Galatians 5, the works of the flesh. Right. Now, he does not say that those are the works of the flesh. We miss a technicality of the language there. Okay. Paul does not say that these are the works of the flesh. He said the works of the flesh are manifest, manifested mm. in that. which are these. Yeah. So what is the flesh in Galatians? For Paul, the flesh in the Galatians, he tells us in Galatians chapters 1 and 2, have you begun by the Spirit, that is the gospel of grace, right, and right. you think that now you are perfected by the flesh. What mm, was the flesh? Wow. The flesh was fleshly attempts at keeping a law. And which, so, uh, which the and, Jews did for thousands of years right. and failed miserably. Yeah. And, so, and so when he said the works of the flesh are manifest, which mm. are these, he's not... He's not saying those are the works of the flesh. He's saying that's how the works of the flesh is manifest. He's already defined flesh for us in Galatians. It's fleshly attempts at keeping the law. So here's the point that Paul is making. Anytime you bend your heart and your conscience and your will toward the flesh, the only thing the flesh can manifest as mm. is adultery. Wow. Fornication. Yeah. Those type. That's yeah. the reason why legalism produces pr- produces sin. Yeah. That's like telling a child, don't touch that hot stove. <laughs> exactly. And What's he going to do? He's going to be screaming scream five seconds. Five seconds later. And <laughs> yeah. here's, here's something that I've come to realize about uh, the law, uh, legislating. Uh, I don't think you can legislate holiness. You now, cannot. some, may, some no. may disagree with me and say, okay, well, well, we've got these standards. We have standards. Uh, here's the thing I know. When you make a law in a local church, then you have to have a police force. Yeah, you do. Mm-hmm. That's Somebody right. go around and measure, and uh, but if you could get it in the heart. But when it's the law uh, of the spirit that that Paul talks about in in Romans eight, eight, yeah, uh, that's what's that's what was the intent of the law. Yes, yeah, sir. In in chapter seven, he's quibbling over, you know, I try the law, I try this, but my flesh gets in the way. I can't, I don't. But he said, but when I came to Christ, yes. Mm. He said, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not, not after, after the, flesh. the flesh, what you talked about, but after the Spirit. The thing of it is, is that's not a license to do every no. carnal no. bad thing. In fact, it's just the opposite. It is just the right. opposite. It's just the opposite. It gives he, you the freedom. He says, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus yes. hath made, made me, me free, free from right. sin and death. And so when it's the law of the Spirit, the Spirit becomes the police. The mm. Spirit becomes the one that's monitoring behavior. The yes. Holy Ghost becomes the one yes. that's the convictor. Yes. Right. And, and, and while the pastor... Can't be there when you're nope. in the privacy of your bedroom. The Holy Spirit can. And, and I think, when the pastor's not there, when you're browsing on the internet, right. the Holy Spirit the is. Holy Spirit. Right. And we, I think we've lost that to a certain degree when we make it that that the pastor has got to be the legislation, the police force, and uh, the the one that goes and he's the judge and the jury. And uh, then all of a sudden, it, it, well, if my pastor don't tell me I can I can do it. Yeah, you know, if, you know it, mm-hmm. I'm, but. It, what am I supposed to do? Yeah. That's where the power of the Holy Spirit comes That's in. That's right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that leads us into our next question. Uh, you said in that same chapter, uh, and I quote, Where are we as a movement when we make stronger defenses for our traditions than we do for the commandments of God? So why do you think that we're more comfortable with our traditions than the commandments of the Almighty God? Because there are they're ours, we invented them, so we know the ins and outs and the details of they what, were what, right. <laughs> you know. They were right, oh, exactly. Yeah. In my humble but accurate Woo. opinion, that's right, you exactly. Know, we're right. exactly. <laughs> and so it's it's easier to become familiar with our mm-hmm. tr- traditions and rules that we impose because we invented them. So we're yeah. more. It takes a lot more work to become that intimately in, involved with the laws of God and the commandments right. of God. It takes mm-hmm. a lot of work in Scripture to do that. Yeah. It don't take a lot of work to say, hey, this is a rule that I'm imposing, and, and uh, here's why. Here's why. Right. Yeah, that, that simple but great answer. Absolutely. Uh, going on, you quote, uh, as a younger preacher, I spoke authoritatively on issues beyond my years. I spoke on issues that I had neither been tested nor 
fully grasp their significance. So speaking to our young listeners, our young leaders and uh, young ministers out there, um, how can a young minister or a leader learn to navigate the challenging and changing world of labels and still maintain a strong, uh, maintain being strong in doctrine? Well, just be strong in doctrine and that what that fundamental doctrine is, know the oneness of God, know the gospel, know mm. baptism in Jesus name, preach the gospel. Yeah. And all of the, the secondary issues related to governing yeah. the church and preaching standards at 18, 19, 20 years old. Yeah. You don't have the foundational no. or experiential authority to be getting up and, and speaking about those issues as as though you are an authority on on those I'm issues. Like, because yeah. time, I promise you, I'm living proof of it. I've preached against so many things in my life in my younger years that that I no longer live by or hold to. Yeah, because I was speaking about things that I would later be tested on, yes. and come to find out the Scripture didn't validate what I said. Right. What I said. If you're called of God, young man, you're going to have plenty of years of ministry. Yes. To figure out where you are on these issues, and so you don't have to announce to the whole world the first year you're preaching every conviction that you have. Mm, and that's smart. It, it uh, the other night in your message here. Uh, you mentioned about the analogy of the chef learning to that that their palate is so precise that they can identify different flavors and different things. I, th I think that the young man of God has got to start honing his palate. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you know, and being very aware of okay, this is this is truth. That's not truth. And the way you know truth is you handle truth from the yeah. Word of God Absolutely. over and over and over. Yeah. So anything fake that comes along That's is right. readily identified. Well, and so, that goes in with uh, the bank teller. They say, yeah, well, exactly. how, many, how many times have you stopped you know, counterfeit bills coming in, and how are you able to do that? Well, it's because I've handled the real stuff for yeah. so right. long that I can it feels, tell. It, I right. feel it. Yeah. It, you know, I'm just so used to everything that was the truth and what was yeah. real. Then whenever something fake and something that was wrong comes up, I can identify it immediately. Right. A good cook that's familiar with his ingredients can taste it in a dish even after it's all been blended and cooked together. Mm. The problem is is we have we have too many young preachers that are cooking with ingredients they haven't tasted. And they you know, that's, that's good. it's great to read, it's great to listen to preachers, but they're just gonna take something off of that and that's say, right. Hey, I'm I'm gonna go put this together and get in the word. That's right. Absolutely. Know it. Know Absolutely. It. So uh a few episodes ago, we were honored to have uh, Dr. Joel Reveille, uh That was an incredible with... episode. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we did talk about questions, uh, on questioning the Bible. Why do you think uh, questions are important when it comes to the Word of God? And why does it seem that many apostolic leaders avoid asking questions? Well, first of all, questions are important because um, questions are divine prompts to revelation. Mm -hmm. mm. That... If we don't ask questions, then what do we not get? Yeah. Answers. Yeah. Exactly. And so the reason why we we um, have questions and, and the reason why the questions are important is because they lead to revelation. They lead to understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what was the second part of uh, why do we avoid? Right. Why do we avoid questions? I think I think part of that is is uh, because too often we do lean heavily into, really heavily into both our, our human traditions and um, uh, a misunderstanding of pastoral authority. And so the question, when the question is asked, it becomes personal. It's a personal yeah. attack on me. Yeah. Whenever my theology and my view is about Scripture, yeah. then it's not personal. Yeah. Right. It's not an attack on me. When you're asking a question about Scripture, I'm disconnected from it, so I can, I can without emotion, help you work through the details of that. Absolutely. But when you're challenging something that I've come up with, something I've invented, then when you disagree, I'm, I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that personal. Yeah. Right. Well, I think that that you know when you we talked about it a while ago was our traditions, yeah, our convictions, yes, our mm -hmm. and and they're not necessarily. Uh, found it on scripture, then all of a sudden we've got to defend them yes, vehemently. That's, that's right. Because we don't want to be wrong. That's right. right. And uh, I think I think questions are really paramount they to are. a person, especially a young minister, right. growing 
ask questions. You get that's with right. a you get with a a, a a John Carroll, ask questions. You Absolutely. get with you that's know right. uh, a, a, a Tim M. Gill. Walls, mm-hmm. yeah, ask questions. That's right. right. You get around these kinds of of men, ask questions. That's because right. You, you, and and the problem is, as I write in the final chapter of my book called Moving Forward, yeah, that if we shut down the if we shut down if we shut that down when people come to us to ask questions, we don't stop the questions. We only stop the questioners. Hmm. Hmm, that's good. They're, they're, they're going to no. They're going to ask, but they're going right. to ask somewhere else. Ask somewhere else, and, and some... they're going to ask some place that it's unsafe. Yes. Right. They're going yes. to ask some place where they're not going to get the proper answer. Right. And so we don't shut down. We don't keep them from asking questions. We just keep them from asking us mm. the mm. questions. That's good. That is. Oh. And I also think partially is that whenever you know ministers get up, we preach the word is the truth. It's the truth. It's the truth. But when we have a question, we feel like we've just lied <laughs> because you have you're honestly having a question. Well, what does this mean? What and you feel like you're going against the word of God because I'm asking a question on this, no. and so you feel unsure in yourself. That's not the case at all. No, that's not the case at all. God is God made His word to where we would ask questions to learn more. About in fact, him. in fact, God Himself says to Israel, "Come, let us reason together." Mm, absolutely. Yeah. God is a reasonable God. He, in fact, inherent to the nature of God is logos. Yes, or, sir. Or word, logic. Logic, yeah. And so, so God is God is an intelligent, logical being. What was that, st- that quote talking about, Brother Revelation? What was that quote he said about mm. false doctrine? False doctrine are just um, unfinished are questions. Unfinished questions. Right. False doctrine is unfinished questions. That's right. Man, incredible that's some, statement. That's an incredible, incredible statement. Incredible statement. Uh, so uh, you wrote in chapter 8, and I quote, What good is a conviction that is held against one's conscience? It is neither honorable nor noble, but out of peer pressure, men feel forced to hold views that they do not believe for the sake of fellowship and even friendship. So uh, the revival that hit America in the early 1900s was marked by people embracing new convictions and change. How has our aversion to change stifled revival in the American apostolic movement? And so I I think, uh, I'm I'm not for sure you can tell me if this is answering your question or not, but the the revival that happened with uh, a revival of of what what we now call personal conviction with a lot of the early revivals, and I think we talked about it earlier, and a lot of the um, uh, revivals early on in America, th- there would be times where people would come and bring their their wedding bands and yeah. watches and right. and put them in an offering plate. Mm-hmm. What was an, what was initially a contribution of sacrifice, we then turned we turned that sacrifice into conviction. Mm. We turned that sacrifice into a standard. Yeah. Wow. When 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 what brought the revival was not the fact that they took their wedding band off or their watch off. What brought revival so was, was sacrifice. the sacrifice and the commitment to the purpose of God, even at personal expense. Right. It wasn't that they couldn't have had revival with the ring on. Mm-hmm. It was just that bringing that sacrificial, very personal sacrificial gift helped fund missionaries, helped fund revivals around the world. Yeah. And then, But what we did was we took what was a first-gen sacrifice, we turned into a second-generation standard. Yeah. That's good. And it's kind of like the, uh, the story I told you earlier uh, about the 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 woman who was praying and her cat was calling all over her and so she'd get up at eight o'clock in the morning and she'd go pray and stick the cat every time she went to pray she'd stick the cat in the cage her son watches her doing this and so when he gets older and he gets married he goes and buys him a cat and a cage and so every morning at eight o'clock in the morning he gets up and prays and puts the cat in the cage but the reason that she put the cat in the cage to begin with is that it was a distraction to prayer. So he did it out of just following an instinct. Mm-hmm. Now his daughter comes along, which would be the granddaughter. She gets a cat and she gets a cage. And all she does is get up at eight o'clock in the morning and put the cat in the cage. <laughs> That's and there right. was no, uh, There's no prayer. prayer. I think if, if, if you're going to see a fence up, yeah. and I've often heard this, you need to ask who put it there mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. why. Yeah. And I distinguish between fence and landmarks. I believe yes, the Bible sir. does too. Fences you can move. Yeah. Landmarks, landmarks you can't. can't. Absolutely. But uh, so I, I think it's very important that that we know what brought revival. Well, sacrifice. Was sacrifice. That's right. Mm-hmm. But that's 
consistent throughout all of That's scripture. Right. right. Sacrifice. It's like it's just it would be the same thing. People would sell boats and houses. Yeah. Right. To give sacrificially to mission. That don't mean that selling your house and your boat has to become a standard. Right. Mm. Right. That we do from and don't don't mess with people's boats. Bro. That's Come exactly on, right. Mess with their guns, Our hunt so. rifles. That's yeah, exactly right. Don't right. mess with their golf clubs. You know? That's <laughs> right. No. no. <laughs> so that leads us to our final question. Uh, you wrote in that same chapter, and I quote: "As fathers and leaders, we must never be afraid to communicate to our families and followers that certain applications of truth may have an expiration date on them, while their principles never do." Will you please expound on that? So, I th- uh, part of Part of where that would come from would be, a part of where that would come from would would be Paul's uh, use in First Corinthians uh, about for this present distress, it's good not to marry. Mm-hmm. Well, well, that can't become a standard. Not marrying can't mm-hmm. become a standard right, for right. all generations and all times. Yeah. For even Paul said, it's good that I would that the younger women marry and bear, bear children. Right. So why is he saying here it's good not to marry? For the present distress, when he's saying, I would that the younger women marry and bear children, where marrying is the permanent principle. Okay. There was an impending, I think Paul was anticipating the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and, and the, the, the tribulation upon the first century church. Right. And he was saying, because of this impending distress, it's probably good not to bring a wife and kids into this type of this type of situation. Wow. And so for the present distress, it's good not to marry. But yeah. Paul never intended that temporary injunction yeah. to become a permanent standard. So, so it had an out. expiration date. It had an expiration right. date on it. As a, you know, we are so pronged as as human beings to make things, uh, make doctrines out of things that are not there. For instance, uh, when, when Jesus healed... There's three different blind men that come to mind when Jesus healed these blind men. One he spoke to, one he spat on the ground, <laughs> one he told to go to, yes. uh, you know, washing the shalom, one, one he spit in his eye, one he made the med and stuck it in his eye. So multiple methods, yeah, same, same result. result. Same result. And sometimes we get so caught up, and the reason that I think that sometimes Jesus did things m- multiple ways is so we wouldn't make a doctrine out of it. That's right. Mm-hmm. When That's he, right. he didn't intend it to be. That's so exactly. you don't want us going around spitting in people's eyes? No. Spit, here's in your eye. <laughs> Jesus. Son of a high I think with that, we need to wrap it up. <laughs> hey, everybody, it's been great to be here today. We have so enjoyed our discussion and conversation with Pastor Carol, and let us just talk to you briefly uh, about this book that we've been talking about here on the podcast. Are you a Christian redefining uh, apostolic by John C. Carroll? Get it at Amazon. But if you'd like to have, we're going to be given a copy of this away. We're going to ask you to sign it and Absolutely. it'll be available for, for the person Absolutely. who gets it. But once this is posted on our Facebook page, Kingdom Link uh, podcast, our Facebook page, Go to it, make a comment underneath of it. Your name will be registered. And also, we would encourage you, let us know that you're a subscriber to uh, Forward Talk and also uh, have been a subscriber and a follower of Kingdom Link Podcast. We want to bless somebody with this great Absolutely. book. Absolutely. Brother Carol, it's been great to have you here with us it's on been my this pleasure. particular podcast. and. And uh, would you like to have anything to say in conclusion? I just want to say what an honor and a pleasure it's been to uh, be with Kingdom Link and to do this uh, collaborative episode between Forward Talk and Kingdom Link. It's been it's cool. my honor to be here. So thank Absolutely. you very much for having me. You have anything to say, add, David? It's been great. I don't think I could have anything to say. It's awesome. One thing that we want to talk to you about, Kingdom Link, is that we have a new podcast coming out every first and third Thursday of the month. Subscribe. Get on board with us. We're honored to have you here. We appreciate all of your reviews. We appreciate you uh, hitting the like button and uh, submitting and sharing our our podcast. Our goal here is to bring generational leaders together, together, generational ministries. So here at Kingdom Link, we believe that leadership only matters if it is passed on. So we encourage you, go and pass it on today. (music) 